Tonight, I am very excited to welcome Jonathan Blitzer celebrating the release of Everyone Who's Gone Is Here. Jonathan Blitzer is a staff writer at The New Yorker. He has won a national award for education reporting as well as an Edward R. Murrow Award and was a 2021 Emerson Collective Fellow at New America. He lives with his family in New York City and Blitzer will be in conversation with Evan Osnos. Evan Osnos is a staff writer at The New Yorker, a CNN contributor, and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I'd also like to mention that tonight's event is actually in partnership with New America, so thank you so much for it to, to them. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Jonathan Blitzer and Evan Osnos. you all for coming tonight to celebrate this terrific, uh, extraordinary book. And I, I know that you think that we say that whenever we do a book talk. We don't actually feel that way. <laughs> in this case, this book is an extraordinary book. Um, I, I, it is, uh, this is an event I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, John is a friend and a colleague from The New Yorker, but more importantly, I think in a way that nobody has figured out how to do, he has written the very hard book, which is to say that he draws connections across time, across motives, across guilt and innocence, across place, and situates it in this extraordinary drama that is, um, if it was fiction, you would be impressed, it's all real. And of course, it's urgently contemporary. What's happening to us, this issue of immigration in this country is, um, it is our, probably our defining issue. It is also the dividing line in our politics right now. And uh, it is a hallmark of our values. And it is the thing I think that haunts us these days as we think about the degree to which we're fulfilling our own standard for ourselves. I, I'd wanna say just at the outset, if you could, raise your hand please if you or your spouse is an immigrant to this country. Uh, leave your hands up for a second. Please raise your hand if your one of your parents was a uh, was an immigrant, and then uh, raise your hand if one of your grandparents was an immigrant to this country. Okay, I like this because, um, as some of you may know, immigrants uh, have an extraordinary record in this country. They win Nobel prizes at about twice the rate of U.S. born citizens. Evidently, they also buy books at a higher rate. I'm pleased to report. <laughs> It is also a fact that our immigration system in this country is, to use the ubiquitous phrase, broken. And until a few days ago, that was essentially a bipartisan uh, consensus. They had very different ways of thinking about it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the contemporary issue. But what we're, what we're really thinking about is the, the human experience. And uh, I, we're gonna, in a minute, we'll get to a reading. But before we do, John, I, I, I wanted to, um, set the scene a bit by asking about how, you've been covering immigration for a long time. This is a book that covers in effect, essentially a half century of history, both personal and political. And I'm, as you were sitting down to write about this grand subject, how did you decide after the inevitable moment of, oh my God, what have I done? I've signed a book contract on an impossible subject. <laughs> how did you decide what story to tell and how to tell it? First of all, thank you, Evan. I mean, this is an honor for me to be here with all of you and especially with Evan. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, it's obviously intimidating to step into this history and to try to sort of find a narrative way into the broader story. Um, and so actually for me, the kind of through line were just individual people. Um, that, it calmed me down in a repertorial sense because I felt like, okay, I need to follow these people. I don't have to sort of like crack the code of these insoluble policy questions. I don't have to presume to be authoritative in understanding you know, the, the intricacies of the US relationship with the region. These are things I can begin to tease out, but if I, if I continue to follow the right sorts of people, um, I can kind of learn from them, uh, and they can kind of show me that what they embody ends up being the kind of broader history. It took me years to meet a lot of these people. Uh, and so actually, fortunately, by the time I was crazy enough to try to do this thing, uh, I had known a lot of them for many years. Um, and, and so they had kind of shown me the way even before, I mean, I wouldn't have even presumed, frankly, to, to undertake this story had I not been in contact with them. 
but we, and we're going to talk about them in yeah. a second, but before you even get to that point, you, there is a big idea that is at the heart of this, which is, a, in a sense, a linkage between two grand narratives. One is the American immigration system and experience, and the other is American foreign policy, particularly as it originated in the Cold War. These two things explain where this the shape of this. And I wonder if you could help us understand why it is that you decided that you had to understand American Cold War policy in Central America if you wanted to understand the world we inhabit now. Yeah, and you know, we were just starting to talk about this before we came out. Um, you, you can't know people or try to even move around in the space, in the region or here in certain senses without bumping right up against this history. And so just as an example, you know, in 2015, this is what I was saying earlier, in 2015, um, there was a theft in Seattle at the University of Washington. There was a human rights organization at the university that did all sorts of public records requests. Uh, and the idea was they worked with Salvadoran partners to try to recover kind of key aspects of the history of the Salvadoran Civil War. And the public records laws in El Salvador aren't as robust as they are here. And so for researchers and human rights advocates in El Salvador, they keep running into walls. They would try to get answers on, you know, what their gov you know, what the government had done or what the military had done during certain moments in time through the 80s, and they just kind of couldn't actually narrate out what was happening. And amazingly, the answers were all in the documents of the American government, the State Department, the Defense Department, the CIA. Um, and so these Salvadoran advocates were working with American academics to try to piece together their history, the history of what had happened in their country in the 80s. And the reason, I mean, this this is to, to people, to sort of Latin America heads or to people, sort of history buffs, this is sort of all on the surface. Um, but I remember feeling, in, in this was in 2015, there was a computer uh, on the desk of the director of this human rights center at the University of Washington uh, that was stolen a week after they had announced a giant lawsuit uh, against the CIA for a technical reason, that the CIA hadn't produced documents in time, and it was a little bit of a sort of a pretext for them to kind of announce this report that they were doing. But it was broadcast, th their announcement of this lawsuit was broadcast simultaneously from Seattle uh, to San Salvador. And there was immediate suspicion mm -hmm. that Salvadoran elements you know, not just we think of all of the people who fled the Salvadoran Civil War and came to the United States. At a certain point, a quarter of the Salvadoran population came to live in the United States. It's just a staggering number of people. Um, but among them weren't just people fleeing violence, but some of the people who perpetrated the violence. So there was also this kind of immediate eerie feeling mm. in Seattle, Washington in 2015 that, wait a second, are, are veterans involved in this theft? Mm. And so this is the kind of thing I would bump into. I, you know, something that you'd think, okay, this is like a kind of recondite historical topic. And like, no, in fact, this is like stuff that's happening every day. It would be too convenient if we actually know who stole. Do we know who stole the? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, try, okay. I went to El Salvador Stay to try tuned. to find out. But. Volume two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll Tune in next week. Solve the mystery. Uh, but I, I, in the course of that process, I, I think you met somebody that became essential to this book, right? Is that how you first met Eddie or? Tell, yeah. tell us about, uh, for people who don't, there are sort of three or four major characters in this book, and they are fully realized people, but we're going to talk about one in just a minute. Um, but uh, just because you started on that story, I find it kind of interesting. How did that lead you to a person who then you pull on that thing, that thread, and off you go? Yeah, I mean, this will show you kind of just how accidental some of this stuff has been over the years. So I was in El Salvador in late 2015, early 2016, trying to figure out who stole this computer in Seattle. Um, and, I, and I wound up meeting this ex-colonel who was a war criminal and who was the subject of this pretty deep investigation. And he was an American ally and he was trained by US advisors and so on in the 80s. Um, and the whole point of my trip to El Salvador at that moment in time was to meet this colonel and to sort of like ask him point blank what his involvement was. By the way, what did your spouse think of that venture? <laughs> we, were uh, not, we were not then married. Got it. Uh, a, a crucial detail. Um, <laughs> And while I was there, um, there was something else that had really intrigued me that I wanted to pursue. Uh, and it was something I'd been hearing from friends, from Salvadoran friends, um, but also from other friends across Central America, that the call center industry was exploding in the kind of 2010s. Um, and that one of the reasons why the call center industry was exploding at that moment in time was deportations were picking up from the United States. And the people who were, by and large, getting deported to Central America at that time had spent years living in the United States and spoke fluent, idiomatic American English. And they found themselves in this 
utterly paradoxical situation of you know having grown up and lived in the United States, eventually for reasons we can get into, technical reasons of the law, getting deported. Um, and when they arrive in these countries that they barely know, that they maybe left when they were kids, their job prospects were pretty slim to start with. And there were these call centers where speaking English was an asset and it was a wage and they could begin to build their lives. And by the time I tuned into that story, there was a cottage industry of English language schools that was cropping up in San Salvador. Uh, and these schools were designed to train Salvadorans to speak English for work in the call centers. So sort of like, you know, classic English language instruction, but with this inflection, this customer service inflection. So you can imagine the, the classes were strange to sit in on. Mm. Um, and I had heard about this and, and wanted to just know more. And so basically, while I'm chasing after this colonel, every, um, everyone I met, you know, journalism kind of gives you a wide berth socially where you can kind of ask obnoxious questions. I asked basically everyone I encountered, you, you know, do you, do you know someone who works in the call centers? Mm -hmm. And eventually, someone led me to this guy, Eddie Anzora, mm -hmm. who at the moment, at that moment in time, was running an English language school called English Cool. Mm -hmm. um, English Cool. English Cool. That is actually a brilliant yeah. name, yeah, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. And Eddie's probably the most interesting person I've ever met in my life. I mean, just, I, I, I mean, I remember to this day, I mean, we, we, we sat down for a beer and I basically asked him one question, and I don't know that I spoke for an hour. I was just wrapped. <laughs> And Eddie had grown was up. Was it customer service English that he was <laughs> totally, giving you? Like, totally, let totally. me connect you to my manager. I was very satisfied with the conversation. <laughs> um, and what was incredible about it was he, he spoke Spanish with a kind of Chicano accent because he grew up in LA. Uh, his English had a kind of funny lilt to it because it wasn't his first language. He came to the United States when he was three years old in 1980, grew up in South Central Los Angeles, uh, started to witness while growing up in Los Angeles the rise of the earliest incarnation of the street gangs that now are so notorious and widely known. Because these gangs, as some of you know, because I, I, I know some of you personally that you know, uh, that these gangs started on the streets of American cities before they metastasized through the region. Um, Eddie witnessed them when they were, like when MS-13, for instance, were just a bunch of goth rocker types. Like their style was different, their hair was long and greasy. And Eddie, who was not a violent type, but who was a mischievous one, mm. um, was just a student of the kind of like gang culture in South Central. You had to be if you wanted to live there and kind of maneuver your way around it. And I basically, I'm sitting in a bar in San Salvador with Eddie. And here I was thinking, okay, like we'll talk specifically about what it's like to run one of these English language schools. And like I'll have a kind of tidy little story to write and to think about. And we spent the whole time talking about Los Angeles in the 1980s and 90s. And I came away thinking like, I didn't know any of this. I mean, I felt a, a kind of a, a great mix of almost shame, but like mm. excitement to learn more. I mean, this is like my story too, in a way. I'm American and he knew more and we were learning. I mean, I was learning about this in San Salvador. He eventually had gotten deported, which is the reason he was there. And his selling point at his, la at his language school was, and, and Eddie is a hustler. I mean, he is like the most American entrepreneurial. He's always got an angle. And his selling point for his language school was, learn English with a native speaker. Hmm. Um, and so he was, you know, I, and, and, you know he, would, he would joke in, in Spanish, someone who's deported is a deportado, but he would say, ah, no, 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 I'm a deportista, which is, you know, an athlete. He's, and, and just, I hung on his every word and, and still do to this day. I talk to him multiple times a week. You, you, there are these very long and clearly developed relationships in this book. And I, I want to actually, uh, if you would, if you would read a bit about, about, uh, Juan Roma Goza, who is a key part of this story and actually um, has a Washington piece of his story. And I think there's something that you've got queued up. But it would be useful to tell people a little bit more about him and maybe set the scene on, on where you are and what's happening. Yeah. So, so Juan, if Eddie was kind of the inspiration in some ways by opening my eyes to different facets of this topic, um, Juan is kind of the beating heart of the project. Um, and I, to this day, I, I feel lucky to know him. He is, just to give you a very quick summary of who he is before I launch in. So Juan is a doctor by training who in 1980 was kidnapped by the Salvadoran National Guard, brutally tortured, deliberately incapacitated so that he couldn't perform surgeries. Um, that was what his training was in. They um, shot him through his arm. They shot him through his arm. They deliberately destroyed nerves in his arm. Um, he was, to to those familiar with the history, 
I mean, he was he was actually close, personally close with um, Monsignor Romero, Oscar Romero, the the Archbishop of San Salvador, and incre- I mean, a, a, a saint, an actual saint. He's been sainted, um, and uh, and Juan basically survives this horrible torture, escapes to Mexico. In the years that he's recovering in Mexico, gets involved in a kind of group of activists uh, who were helping move Guatemalan refugees who were fleeing their civil war, which is going on from the 1960s to the mid 90s, through Mexico to the United States. Eventually, he arrives in the United States himself, becomes a community leader and public health advocate, first in Los Angeles, then in San Francisco, and eventually, and this is why it's moving for me to be reading this here, comes to Washington DC and works at a storied medical clinic for you know, Central American immigrants, and especially the undocumented, called La Clinica del Pueblo, which some of you will know. Um, in Adams Morgan, I think. In Adams Morgan. Yeah. yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Thank you. We, were, we regret the error. I think. These are divisive issues. Yeah. This event is over. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so this passage that I, that I have queued up is um, about a moment in, and, and I've sort of obscured the final aspect of Juan's story, which we can talk about later, which is a kind of a major historical event. Um, but basically, this is when Juan is working at La Clinica, um, in, and this is in the early 1990s. And the kind of idea is to, well, to show you. I mean, you can, this is an experience I've had in the 2010s to now. You're walking down the street in Central America, and you feel like you could, you've just walked into an American locale, or vice versa. And so that's sort of a little bit the, the feeling here. The man was in his mid-40s neither tall nor short, with a thick mustache and a slight build, an ordinary looking person who generally escaped notice. But Juan Ramagosa had seen him around during the late winter of 1991, once at a nearby migrant shelter, and a few times out on the streets, where he squatted in the abandoned houses that Juan passed on his way to work. He was homeless and an alcoholic, with tattered clothes and sickly reddened eyes. The Adams Morgan neighborhood around La Clinica del Pueblo was full of people like that, especially Salvadorans and Guatemalans who arrived in the city traumatized, war-haunted, and alone. On Tuesday nights, the only day of the week the clinic was open for general consultations, homeless immigrants entered the open doors of the dilapidated brick building on Irving and 15th Street Northwest and hid out in the basement. They blended in with the crowds of people arriving for appointments. In search of a place to sleep, many of them started on the third floor for medical attention, then slunk off downstairs. At a certain point, usually around one or two in the morning, the clinic's volunteers had to turn everyone out before closing. Juan's office opened directly onto the waiting room, a big, well-appointed space that had once belonged to a church rector with old wood wainscoting. It was the only aesthetic flourish at La Clinica. The building's boiler rarely worked, and broken windows were patched with makeshift plastic coverings that hung at angles. The vastness of Juan's office meant that it was constantly packed with supplies and people rushing in and out for meetings. The chip tile floor smelled of pine salt. Beginning his shift one night, Juan glimpsed the man, but didn't have time to introduce himself. Juan never stopped moving. Each night at the clinic was an exercise in chaos control. The appointment started at around six, as soon as the first doctor arrived, and within minutes, more than 70 patients showed up. Conversations blared. Juan greeted the patients and introduced them to a team of volunteers with clipboards, who took down their information. Juan made rounds, cleaning, advising, directing. If he saw someone throwing something away, he'd swoop in to inspect it in case it could be saved or repurposed. Resources were tight. Tables, furniture, and basic medical equipment, like blood pressure monitors, came through small grants and donations from Catholic and Quaker charities. Diagnostic testing went through the George Washington Medical Center, where some of the volunteer doctors worked by day. The medications came in the pharmaceutical sample sizes that drug reps dropped off in small cartons for doctors. There were no fixed hours at La Clinica, just a continuous run that sometimes didn't end until dawn. At around 10 o'clock, the man with the mustache elbowed his way through the waiting room to reach Juan. I need to talk to you, he said. He respectfully addressed Juan as usted. They moved to a quieter corner of Juan's office. You were a prisoner. You were beaten and tortured, the man began. I want to tell you that I was there. I saw what they were doing to you. I was part of it. He began to cry, explaining that he too was from Uslutan. The man's name was Pedro. He'd been a member of the National Guard. Everyone who fled the war for the US arrived jilted or debilitated. But of all the refugees Juan observed at La Clinica, 
The ex-soldiers tended to be in the worst shape. Most of them had become addicts. They lived on the streets and kept to themselves. As a doctor, Juan took an analytic view of their profiles. Many lower level soldiers had been conscripted and were often tortured if they were caught absconding or disobeying orders. Some of them were campesinos themselves, not so much sadists as cowed conformists who had been indoctrinated during their military service. Juan wasn't naive about the savagery of their past acts. He just felt that the war had victimized everyone in different ways. Pedro, for instance, had become a pariah wherever he went. Among the other immigrants in Washington, he was a villain, but in El Salvador, he'd be tortured for desertion. Sometimes argument erupt, arguments erupted at La Clinica when a patient revealed he'd served in the military. Many volunteers felt these men didn't deserve treatment, but Juan disagreed. La Clinica had higher responsibilities, he said, in his gentle yet implacable way. Its obligations were medical and quasi-religious. His genuineness convinced everyone. Eventually, he organized group therapy sessions exclusively for ex-soldiers, which became the most interesting of his meetings. At the start of his sessions, he introduced himself in a way that made clear he'd never forget the sins of the armed forces. I was not a part of the army, nor the police. I wasn't even a member of the guerrillas. I was helping campesinos who were against the army. I cured them and gave them treatment. But for that, this is what happened to me, he said. Then he held up his deformed hand. He's an extraordinary presence in this story. And in some ways, I, he kind of crystallizes the idea of suffering and survival and salvation, which is a slightly separate matter. And he is responsible for the title of this book, I think, right? Talk a bit about what happened later and maybe a bit on why he is, where, how he kind of, what he was getting at with the title of this book, but also why you thought that he could capture some of these what you hoped he would be able to convey, the larger themes about this book. Yeah. So um, Juan, I had known about Juan, of all of the people who figure in this book, I had actually known about Juan the longest um, because he'd been in the news more than really anyone else in the book. Um, in 2002, there was a human rights case that was tried in a civil court in Florida. Um, and it was a case involving two Salvadoran generals who had been allies of the United States who had been relocated at a time when Salvadoran asylum seekers were rejected at extremely high rates um, for reasons related to American geopolitical biases. Um, the generals who presided over the army were quietly relocated and given green, uh, were given green cards to live in, in the United States. Um, and eventually they were discovered. And there was this human rights case in Florida that Juan was the main witness and uh, plaintiff in. Um, and the idea was to use a kind of, at the time, somewhat obscure strand of human rights law to bring these guys to justice. And what happened after that, so that trial was in 2002, and what happened after that, years later, was the Department of Homeland Security, having gotten wind then of what these guys were responsible for and relying on the vast documentary record that came up in this civil case, eventually deported these two generals uh, when, they were in their late when they were in their late 70s. Um, an incredible moment. That was in 2015. So that's when I first found out about Juan because I remember just following that story and just being completely astounded by the account that I read and heard of Juan, of Juan's role in it. Um, so I started to go through some of the court testimony and decided, I mean, for years I'd wanted to call him and, and never could quite justify you know, the kind of, you know, inconvenience to him of my calling and just asking questions, especially given also how sensitive a lot of this stuff was. And, that, and that's a strand in this reporting too, of course, which is, you know, people have suffered all kinds of things and their real pains have to be taken, real care has to be taken to not re-traumatize them. Um, and so, you know, I'm really trying to pick my spots too. For instance, uh, the torture that he had suffered, I mean, Juan and I talked in the first year of the pandemic every single day for an hour at the same time. Um, and then in the second year of the pandemic, we spoke four times a week. Now we speak multiple times. I've talked to him about- I could charge you by the hour and do quite or, well. Or I could charge him. I, I mean, you know, so. yeah. he Your and I haven't decided who's therapizing <laughs> whom, you know. Um, but, but, but Juan, um, Juan and I never really talked about his torture, maybe only, maybe once or twice. And the reason for that was because I had, I, we talked around it, 
But I was very careful about kind of forcing him to go back over the details. And I had this vast documentary record. Um, and actually, he once told me, and I'll never forget this, he told me that once we spoke about it, even just glancingly, mm. and he said to me the next day, I did, did not sleep last night. Wow. Um, but anyway, Juan, Juan and I started to talk at the start of the pandemic. Um, at a moment when I was actually a little bit despondent about the prospects for this book because I couldn't travel. And um, one of the kind of strange accidents of the moment was that not only was I shut in at home in New York, but Juan was shut in in Usulutan. Um, and he and I had nothing better to do but, but to talk. Um, and as we started to talk, um, I started to just learn more and more about his story, things I had never read about before. Um, so there had, been some, there had been some journalistic profiles of him during the years of the trial, but I didn't know anything about his involvement in the sanctuary movement, this movement of, of, of advocates, of church-based advocates who helped tend to asylum seekers all through the 80s. Um, I didn't realize that Juan was in Mexico dealing with Guatemalans at a key moment in time. I, I, I didn't know all the details about La Clinica. Um, and it became increasingly clear to me that really the whole, every aspect of this broader history, he, he had just lived. It was, it was, it was in his DNA. Um, and, and really I started, I mean the kind of historical research in, in every case for me branches off of the people. And so, you know, I spent all these years meeting people, reporting, um, and some of them, you know, I, I love talking to all of them, that's why I do the work, but you know, some of them I write about once or not at all. Um, and others, like Juan, kind of just stay with me, and I stay with them. Um, and over the years, I've built up research around him. So I've talked, you know, for that scene in La Clinica, I've ended up speaking to five or six people who were working there, not, not you know, that night, presumably, but at that time, mm -hmm. and starting to fill in his world kind of after the fact. And it's a strange feeling, because I'm doing it in, you know, 2020, mm -hmm. uh, from, you know, sometimes just on the phone. Um, and eventually, I... I you know, spent time with Juan in, in El Salvador, but that was, that was kind of the arc of his story. Oh, I didn't tell you, I buried the lead. <laughs> Sorry. The, the Sorry, we, you guys don't know this, but we're paid by the word at the New Yorker, yeah, yeah. so. It's... <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. Am I talking? Am I talking? Too yeah, much? sorry. No, no. Uh, oh, that's oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Trust me. This yeah. is. It's a big reason you're here. Thankfully, there's no ads. You know. <laughs> yeah. um, no, 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 I just want to say. So, so the the, the, the title of the book, the most the most moving part of it. Um, so Juan, when he was testifying in 2002, um, there's an incredible moment in the courtroom when he he's testified. There were there were two other victims who testified in in horrific detail about what they'd suffered. Um, and at a certain moment, and I have this from this, this transcript, and, and people who were in the courtroom remembered it too, hmm. um, a, a juror passed a note to the judge and said, and then the judge reads it aloud in the courtroom, and this juror was almost apologetic and saying, you know, listen, uh, it would help me if I could see um, the wounds, the physical wounds and scars of these witnesses. And the judge kind of reads this almost uncomfortably in the courtroom. Um, it certainly was not legally necessary, given what was on the table in this lawsuit. Um, and Juan agrees. And one of the other uh, victims who'd been really brutally tortured agrees. And the two of them stand up, walk in front of the jury box, and kind of holding each other up, bear their scars. Um, and Juan rolls up his sleeve and shows the scars on his arm. And um, he and I spoke about this moment. Um, you know, inevitably I asked him, you know, what was it like to stare down these generals? You know, and he, he loved to talk about that and that in the days of the trial, people at La Clinica, he would fly back on weekends to work at La Clinica and everyone would bombard him with questions. What did the, what did the judges say when you mm. introduce this detail, that detail? Um, so I kind of had that sense down of kind of what it felt like for him to be in the courtroom, but I wanted to know, you know, what were you, th what did it feel like to roll up your s sleeve and to sort of bear yourself in front of this jury? Um, and Juan, who's a very religious man, um, described an experience of kind of almost levitating out mm -hmm. of his body and feeling himself merge with all of the people who he had known who didn't survive. And it, this is, it, it's hard to write about Juan because he doesn't seem real. His, he is quite literally saintly. Um, I mean, I, I, it moves me to even just talk about him. Um, you know, he said, at least I have scars to show. Um, and he was describing this feeling of communion with those who couldn't be there, didn't survive. Um, and he said, everyone who is gone is here with me. Um, and I, 
I, I, it was one of the most startling moments of my life. Yeah. It's an extraordinary moment in, in the book. I, I, I want to, we've talked, and I think people are, are, have gotten a, a sense of some of the depth of the people that you invoke in here. The portraits are amazing. I think we, this being Washington, we want to talk also about some policy. And I've been thinking about one of the things that comes through so clearly in here as you tell this, this extraordinary narrative of policy dysfunction and this sort of frantic on again off again search for something coherent that at the at the beginning of the process there was this or it's an ongoing belief in the idea of deterrence deterrence is the thing and there's a phrase i think it's the consequence delivery system if that's not an orwellian phrase i don't know what is talk a bit about the consequence delivery system what is that and to what degree does deterrence as a concept work there's a, generally speaking, um, and I have to say I'm somewhat chastened because I know people in attendance know this stuff quite well. Um, there's kind of a through line that runs across Democratic and Republican administrations on this issue of immigration enforcement. And it is the belief, the conviction that um, the harsher you are as a government to people arriving at the southern border, the more systematically you can send a message to prospective migrants. Uh, to make clear that they can't come, that the border isn't open. Um, and different administrations have played with this idea in different ways. Um, and obviously the most extreme manifestation of that we saw during the Trump era. The family separation crisis is the kind of, you know, classic example of the most rightward expression of this idea. That if we separate, if we literally separate parents and children, then other families won't come. Um, which, of course, you know, don't take my word for it. Um, the next year after that policy, probably the harshest policy in recent memory, the numbers reached unprecedented heights in 2019, the year following. Just to say, you know, when people are fleeing for their lives, the, the border policy on, the, on an enforcement level doesn't change someone's calculus when it comes time to deciding whether or not they leave and seek protection or opportunity. What it, what it does have an impact on are the sort of tactics that someone or the smuggling network that they're relying on would use to actually just get across the border at a particular moment in time. Th that is part of it too, but that doesn't change the kind of overall dynamic of people moving. Um, and so for me, it's, it's tricky to cover, honestly, journalistically, because there's a real disjunct that I, I try in the book to, to, to cover, but it's sort of an, uh, an irresolvable reality, which is the sort of policy levers just don't match the lived experience of people making the journey. Hmm. They just don't. And I, I wish, and, and I say this in the book at a certain point, I wish I could just show, you know, I, I've, because I work at a well-known magazine, and I, I, I'm able to interview top officials about this, and you know we can speak frankly about it. Uh, and so I'll, I, I tried for years to time some of my reporting trips so that right after I'd be sitting in some you know sort of well manicured office, um, getting kind of a an almost academic discussion of what the policy thinking was, I would try then to go to like Tapachula on the border of you know Mexico and Guatemala and see all right like let's sort of see what this actually looks like. And what I would see in places like that would be people who had been deported, brutalized, separated from their children at the border, who were nevertheless making the trip again mm. because they had no alternative. Um, and so there is this kind of fundamental paradox in all of it. Um, and I, I don't know that the two points ever fully connect, mm. that you know what, what you see people going through and what you see people suffering, it, it doesn't line up with the policy thinking um, but that's the kind of general paradigm, and, and until there are other ways, and, and this is where the kind of the policy conversation gets stuck in Washington, but if there were ways of opening up other legal channels, if, if the kind of guiding ethos and um, sort of philosophy in high places was to recognize that you can't, you can't stem the flow of people. Hmm. You can manage it, but you can't block it. 
um, then I think maybe there are opportunities to, to give people legal avenues to come to the United States, which we could talk about. The administration right now has tried in a certain fashion to do that. Yeah. It's complicated under the circumstances. But, but that's, what I, that's what I find. In, in a sense, what, I'm curious how much people who are making that journey are paying attention to American policy. How much does, from what it sounds like, you're saying it doesn't have much impact on their decision making. Um, and yet we still cling to this idea that we're making these adjustments and that that's having some effect on the push factors and which I'm hearing you say is no, actually. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the ritual that everyone here is familiar with of a, a top American official uh, saying, if we're lucky in Spanish, don't come. Hmm. Like that's, you know, somehow gonna reverberate. And, and, and you know, in a certain sense, I, I don't mean to be kind of flip about it. I, I understand the idea, of course, that the government can't seem to be permissive, but, but no one, the people who are who are desperate, uh, who are traveling, you know, with everything on the line, are not kind of heeding these messages. They're not listening. They don't have the means to. They don't have the interest in it. I remember in 2018, uh, I was traveling with, um, at the time, the biggest migrant caravan. They were primarily Honduran uh, asylum seekers moving through. I mean, quite literally walking through the whole of Mexico. And the idea was they were all traveling together because Mexico is famously dangerous for migrants, not just because of criminal elements, but because of state actors, po corrupt police, uh, all sorts of people who would kidnap and extort migrants as they travel. Uh, and I remember being in a town in Oaxaca um, where the, the town itself, at that point the caravan, I believe, was maybe, f f had, there were maybe 5,000 people on the caravan, families, w women, children, fathers, the whole thing. The town that I was in in Oaxaca at that moment had a population of maybe 4,000, mm. um, which is to say we were in a place where if ever the, the public was scared or could be scared or could, say, could, could be said to be overwhelmed by the idea of we're being overtaken, there it was. We were in Oaxaca, population 4,000, migrant caravan 5,000. And I remember checking my phone and seeing at the time an announcement that then Defense Secretary Jim Mattis was saying he was gonna send troops to the border. And it was an incredible moment for me because we're in southern Mexico. Mm. And so the troops that are being dispatched to the border are like you know, 800 miles away. <laughs> um, and it, it, no, one, it, no one, it didn't register with anyone. And there was of course, because this is all happening in October of 2018, there was an assumption that, okay, like maybe there was some sort of ulterior motive here. You know, this has to do with the midterms. Um, and it's hmm. just, no, you talk hmm. to people and they'd be like, huh? It yeah. was just a non sequitur. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, it's great because we started this conversation talking about connection and here we are talking about disconnection in a way too. I think one thing I'm curious about is here we are now um, in the midst of the Biden administration's attempt to reckon with this, the extraordinary numbers at the border right now. Can you help me understand how, what everything that you've done over the last few years has helped you understand how this administration, and particularly to the degree you can, how this president thinks about immigration. What have you learned about that? I'm sort of selfishly interested in that for a yeah, variety yeah. of reasons. Again, but this is an intimidating question to answer in th with this audience. Uh, in New York, it's easy. You know, everyone's, everyone's <laughs> like, oh yeah, he must know. Uh, he's on Amtrak all the time. Um, I would say- Biden is here tonight, actually. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> um, I would say I would say three three general things. Um, the first kind of obvious observation that has policy implications and messaging implications is the obvious displeasure that this administration feels in having to deal with this issue. Mm. Um, from day one, there is a feeling at the in the upper reaches of the government that ugh, this is this issue is just going to consume our whole agenda. The, the, the border issue specifically. And of course, you know, immigration is a much broader, more complex issue than border administration. But there has been this feeling all the way through of, I mean, the, the refrain I hear is, the day in which immigration doesn't come up in the news is a win for us. Mm. So that's just to give you a sense of like, kind of the general orientation. Then we get to the kind of realities of it. Um, the realities of it are, I have to say, I, I'm sympathetic to the administration given what it's up against. It's up against a, a moment of mass migration, the likes of which we haven't really seen in the hemisphere in decades. I mean, there's more, there's pe more people on the move than there have been since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. This is just a fact in the world. Uh, it falls out of the Washington rough and tumble of it, 
but that's just a reality. Um, and you know, as an example, there's a, um, a sort of a treacherous patch of jungle that links Central and South America, uh, known as the Darien Gap. Some people in attendance actually report in the Darien Gap. Um, to give you a sense of the numbers that the administration is up against, as just a global phenomenon, um, up until around 2020, on an average level, there were about 11,000 people who crossed through that patch of jungle. Because it's so treacherous that it's sort of been almost a natural buffer and limitation on, on, on migration. In 2023, that number was 500,000. Mm. Um, and so this administration has had to deal with this global phenomenon at a time when tr the Trump administration sabotaged the mechanisms of government. And so the administration faced this issue of having to build the system back up, facing impossible political wins at a time when global migration is on the rise. Um, and their ethos is, do we have to talk about this? Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to unwind certain aspects of the previous administration's policy. And so there was a lot of fear about um, ending one policy in particular, which had been put in place at the start of the pandemic, which allowed the government to s just expel people at the border without giving them sort of the full option of seeking asylum. That had a paradoxical effect because people were just so quickly expelled, more, they, they tried to cross multiple times. So the numbers exploded. So there was this catch-22 that, okay, we don't want to let go of this authority that allows us to immediately engage in these mass expulsions, which is a resource. How could we let go of this resource? We don't want there to be images of people gathering at the border. Fine, let's take it. Let's hold on to this power. But the longer they held on to that power, the higher the numbers were at the border and the more chaos there was. So they were immediately backed into this corner. I think it took a while for the message to kind of clarify. Now, of course, the politics are so bruising that it's too bad that the message, which I do think has clarified to some degree, is getting lost. And that is, if, if there is a kind of theory of the case, as I understand it, from the current administration, it is to open legal pathways for migrants uh, from all over the world and to increase punishment and harshness uh, for those who tr don't avail themselves of these mm -hmm. pathways, which under the circumstances you know, they're pretty limited. Congress is dysfunctional. You can't really do anything too systemic without Congress. And so the idea has been, you know, we have huge numbers now of Venezuelans, Cubans, Nicaraguans, Haitians showing up at the southern border. At a certain point, a couple of years ago, the administration started to modify its policy so that it would parole in mm. certain uh, segments of that population. And the idea was, rather than handle all of this in the worst place possible, which is at the southern border, we're gonna to try to begin this process farther from the border so that we can manage the arrival of these people in an orderly way. And sure enough, in the first year of that new approach, the percentage of migrants from those countries dropped by 90%. Mm. But of course, you know these are hard things to maintain. Of yeah. course, they're doing this with major partisan headwinds. They're facing lawsuits. The numbers continue to rise, um, but it's, um, it's a, it's a complicated business. I mean, it's easier to be a journalist than a policymaker on this, for sure. Uh, it, we're going to go to questions from all of you guys. There's a lot of knowledgeable folks in the room. And um, as we do, just in the one moment here before the microphone arrives, we're going to have a microphone going around. Um, but if I can, just very briefly, I'm curious. If, if you were king for a day and you had your magic wand and you could say, this is the policy, one policy, it doesn't have to be the solve everything, but here is something that everybody here should be thinking about or advocating for. One thing that could be done, what would that thing be? Yeah, my, my, my preamble to that is that some of the people here have helped me come up with this fantasy scenario, so mm. thank you in advance. Um, I would say if there were a way to somehow um, establish a, a kind of regional approach where the thinking is we're not gonna solve this problem at the border. The only hope we have is to work with foreign governments to set up, um, you know, it sounds so wonky, I realize, regional processing centers across Latin America, increase you know, legal avenues for people to begin to manage what their claim is to come to the United States. And to, to do that, I mean, this is not an earth shattering thought. Mm -hmm. Experts know this. So, if, so the way in which I would use this magic wand wouldn't be to come up with the idea, it's, it's out there. It, it would be to somehow hold yeah. off the politics for long enough so that this approach could bear mm. fruit. 
because it's the problem with it is it's going to take time. I mean, let's be adult about it. It's like, you know, these things are complex, mm. um, but the politics don't allow that. And yeah. so it's not ever taken as a serious solution. And, and what happens is we have these wild swings from one partisan administration to the next. And so there's no continuity in the thinking on this point, which of course everyone in the world could agree on because it's objectively straightforward that yeah. if you want to reduce the pressure at the southern border, you have to build out in the world avenues for people to come. So hmm. that would be... That's yeah. clear. I, the regional yeah. processing centers. I can take that with me. All right. We've got uh, we've got a microphone that'll go around, and I would just uh, gently remind my fellow Washingtonians that we are privileging questions over comments. Uh, a, 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 to quote our colleague Jelani Cobb, a question is usually an, an interrogative statement uh, signaled by the raising of the voice at the end. Over to you. Um, hi. I was curious, given this past week's election, what you see as the future of Central America, specifically El Salvador, um, if there's anything positive, any outcomes of, of, of that sort that you see? Yeah, that's a, re that's a really interesting question. So the, the question is about elections in El Salvador where Najib Bukele, uh, the authoritarian president of the country, who is wildly popular, just won a massive landslide in an election that technically it's unconstitutional for him to be running in. Um, I, I, um, I'm pretty freaked out by that situation, quite honestly. I wish I had a kind of more eloquent response. Um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of reporting on, on Bukele, and, and in particular, I think the thing that's most striking to me now with Bukele is what he has done. For, for those who haven't been following closely, um, you know, the gang problem in El Salvador has been a kind of dominant social problem, um, and violence flared up in 2022. And it, it flared up quite simply because the government was secretly engaged in negotiations with one of the major gangs, and those negotiations went off the rails, and the government response was a wholesale crackdown uh, in, in, on a scale that we've really never seen before. And you know, now there are over 70,000 people in prison facing charges that they can't contest. I mean, I myself have interviewed people who were innocently rounded up. And at the same time, the policy is massively popular in the country. Um, and what's more, it's spreading in the region. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm most alarmed, frankly, by um, the embrace of that policy in places like Honduras, where you, had, you have a leftist president who campaigned on demilitarizing the country and now is embracing this kind of bukele, tough-minded tough approach. Um, and and it, the US relationship to El Salvador has gotten fascinating because you know, Bukele benefited from Trump being in office. Um, it was very easy for Bukele to manage that. All Trump needed were reassurances that he'd be tough on immigration, and that was the end of it. The Biden administration normalized these relationships, the, the, normalized in the sense of be, being a more conventional, level-headed Washington-type administration, said, wait a second, we're going to impose sanctions on corrupt government ministers. We're going we're to make statements anytime there are clearly anti-democratic actions taken by the government. We've watched, in, in so there was a lot of tension early on. That tension has actually been ramped down, um, I think in large part because it's not clear diplomatically what the US can do when there's someone who is this wildly popular doing things that make all of us very uncomfortable um, at a time when I think the main concern that US officials feel is that that economy stays intact. Because if that economy tanks, I mean, I, I know from interviews, the fear among American officials is then we will be dealing with an immigration crisis. And so kind of amazingly to kind of come full circle on the Cold War you know, mentality of making all these allowances for right wing regimes as long as they vowed to work with the United States in fighting communism, you have a similar kind of thinking which is as long as we are aligned in containing the spread of people, we'll look the other way. And that, that's sort of the chapter that I think we're in. Uh, there's a question right up here in, in the front, if you're able to get there. Hi, my husband was a former Foreign Service officer, so I kind of watch ambassadorial announcements. And we've not, thanks to a senator from Texas, had some of the ambassadors in Central America because of him. Do you think that would help? It seems to me it would be nice to have a peaceful you know, have a U.S. representative that was an interim for years. You know, I, I, one hundred percent. I mean, I, I, um, I think it would be very helpful. <laughs> um, I think that the one of the things I'm noticing, um, just on an anecdotal level, uh, 
is you're seeing some of these governments in the region start to price into their engagement with the US an expectation of political chaos here, um, which is hmm. noteworthy and scary. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not surprising. Some of the savviest observers of American political life are governments in the region, and that's been the case for decades. Um, but it's, it's very striking to see now this dynamic, this, this, this degree to which there's kind of an assumption that like, ah, okay, well, there's just gonna sort of be messiness in Washington. And I mean, you know, to the El Salvador question, uh, Najib Bukele assumed that you know, Trump is gonna win his reelection, and so it's, he's just biding his time. Um, so I, I, you can feel that, it's palpable. Uh, we'll get more questions in a second, but I am curious, if, if Trump does come back in to the White House, do you have a sense of what conceivable, I know what they've talked about they wanna be able to do, knowing your sense of how that percolates through the politics and the bureaucracy, what are you most concerned about? It's such a nightmare scenario. Um, We're gonna, we have, you have to end this question on a very happy note, by the way, because you yeah. want people to be really yeah, spun yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, please, another. Um, you know, I have to say, it, 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 and it pains me to say this, um, the Trump administration was very effective in doing what it intended to do. I mean, it's like an inconvenient fact, um, but you know, we kind of have rolled our eyes, I mean, in addition to being scandalized by things like family separation, we've often sort of written off this, you know, the Trump agenda is a kind of chaotic, random agenda of personal vengeance and, and you know, sort of general bile. But I, I actually think on the immigration issue, there is a real unity of purpose. Um, and so I think, you know, any strides that have been made um, in restoring aspects of the legal immigration system, which it's very important and the Biden administration has really done a lot to stand back up. It's not in the news, um, in part because they don't wanna talk about it because any talk of immigration brings everyone back to the border. Um, I think all of those, all of that progress on, on legal immigration um, is gonna be squelched. And actually that's what I fear most. And I, I fear most not, not to say that there aren't gonna be horrific things perpetrated at the border, but just that we've, we've sadly, we've already seen some of them. Um, and so I'm, I imagine we'll see versions of that, but, but I, I kind of felt like that was a story that went a little bit under the radar during the Trump years, just how systematically they shut off legal immigration. And I, I, I feel that that's clearly gonna be a priority if they're back in. I think Quick, we, a positive we, question. We probably have time for one more, one or two more questions if we can. Oh, in the way in the back, this is gonna test our, with apologies to our, uh, gracious hosts is running around. So one of the things that you spoke about was increasing the prospects and numbers of legal immigration. Are the applicants or people who are given legal immigration to the US? But you also mentioned that a lot of these people who are fleeing for their lives aren't necessarily as engaged with the US, US talking points, US policies. How do you balance those two things when these people can't wait? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know from an operational standpoint, honestly, kind of like what you do on a messaging level or making things available. And I do think that you know some of these legal pathways that have that have been used so far definitely scoop up a population that's more able to generate, for example, the necessary documents like passports to do it. And that already is culling a certain segment of those populations. Um, I I think that you know in my experience, this is going to sound very unscientific. Um, in my experience. If there are legitimate avenues for people to come legally, they will take them. Um, and I, you know, I don't know in terms of getting the word out how how one you know what that strategy looks like. Um, but I am generally optimistic. Um, I don't say this as a policymaker. I say this just as a kind of observer of people who I've seen navigate the system. Uh, I think if the system works efficiently and is and is and is undertaken in good faith, I, I, I do think that there are ways that people can can try to avail themselves of it. Sorry, that sounds like an evasion, but I, that's. Yeah. If, Time if we for one last one question. One more question. Otherwise, I'm gonna use the prerogative. Oh, okay, right here, we've got it. So, thank you, Jonathan, congratulations. I'm very excited to, and thank you for your reading. My question is for you as a writer. Um, if you can share a little bit about how you decided to pick the characters that you have, and I haven't read it yet, um, but the two that you've shared so far are just absolutely powerful. Can you just share a little bit about 
how you kind of we decided on which characters, what were you trying to do in terms of the narr narrative arc, and what were the biggest challenges in writing this, especially during the pandemic? I'm so glad to have this question. This is like therapeutic for me to talk about <laughs> after all this time. Um, so I, my relationship with Juan is unlike any relationship I've ever had with anyone. Um, I was like flying blind there. Um, what I did with Juan was we would have these conversations. I would record them. Um, I would send them out to get transcribed because there were too many of them. Um, and I started to create binders, actually, um, which eventually had hundreds of pages. And at a certain point, I stopped recording and, I, or, and or I stopped transcribing because it was just too much material. Um, and then I tried, what I tried to do, like in Juan's case, and, and this was a particular challenge, so each character posed very specific narrative challenges. The biggest challenges with Juan, th there were sort of three with Juan, just to take one example. One is to find a way to write about him that doesn't make him sound unbelievable. Because like as a human being, he is in many ways unbelievable. And if you meet someone like that in the world, you're just moved. But if you read about someone like that in a book, you're suspicious. Um, <laughs> and so there was this question of like, okay, I have to, I have to sort of let his spirituality build. I kind of can't, if I'm too aggressive about sort of proclaiming it myself, it will seem off, it will seem contrived. So that, that was the main challenge. The second challenge was, and this is a challenge I experienced in different ways with everyone, um, a lot of the drama that I narrate in his life happened many years ago. Um, so reconstructing that was a real, kind of lesson for me and a real exercise for me and just sort of needing to open myself up to, you know, my limits as a reporter. And so, you, you know, my, my feeling had always been like, oh, you can't do a story properly unless you can go to a place. And, but in these cases, you would go to a place, I mean, I, I did, when I was in El Salvador, I would, I would go on these drives that m mirrored a route that Juan would take at a certain moment in time, but he took that route in 1983, and I was, you know, here I am in 2022. There, nothing was, I mean, there were a few details that I gleaned from those trips, and then I lost two weeks trying to figure out if the things I saw were in place in the 80s. Like that sign, would that sign have been there in the 80s? You know, it's like very hard to know. Um, so finding ways of building around these people and getting kind of the key circumstantial stuff, um, and then organizing it. Um, so I, with these binders, I, I mean, I remember specifically in the pandemic, um, it's funny, the insanity of undertaking this project I'm realizing now is what sort of saved me from the insanity of the pandemic in a way, because I was just, I was just like, I was washing documents, you know, everyone was going crazy and I was just at home rifling through documents. Um, I, I try, I took these thousands of pages of transcripts from Juan and organized them uh, by, by chronology and theme. And so I basically, with him, and I do this with everyone, I reread all of the transcripts as though they're like a book in their own right. And so that's another way of experiencing the character and beginning to think about ways of imposing some sort of narrative structure on them. Um, so that, that was how, I, mean, I, would, I would think in these ways, and then I would think with, you know, I'd sort of think about how to break up these stories. So like Juan's story starts in 1980 and ends in 2022. Um, so to do that, I'm thinking, okay, kind of like what are the, almost like the chapter divisions in his life, and where can I veer off and kind of encircle some history that you need to know? So as an example, Juan was close with uh, Romero, um, and an amazing resource is that these Romero sermons, these famous sermons, uh, are all recorded. I mean, who knew that they were recorded? So you can listen, I mean, they're recorded so well that you can hear as he's reading the sermon, when someone coughs or when they erupt in applause. And so if I could kind of cross-reference that with an anecdote that Juan would tell me, okay, it took me forever because it wasn't like Juan could say to me definitively, on you know, March 4th, but he could say to me, you know, uh, this one sermon, Monsignor mentioned X, and that was very important to me. I could look for that word. Um, so you could slowly start to fill that out. And it was, I mean, I've never, I'd never experienced anything quite like that. But th that, was the fun, that was the fun of it. Writing it was hell. But, but, <laughs> but reconstructing that was just a joy. I have to say that without knowing that we would talk as much about him, but I jotted down a bit of how you described the experience of interviewing him. You said to talk to him was to enter a flow of unselfconscious reflection. I was asking the questions, but he invited me in. 
there is a quality to that experience that runs through this ex extraordinary book. I, I, I think all of you have gotten a little taste of it tonight, but I encourage you uh, to enjoy it, buy it. Christmas is coming, two copies perhaps. Um, but uh, most of all, please join me in thanking our friend John Blitzer for this.